Listen for the whole entire time with me to wear this. We'll just see what happens. All right. So yesterday was uh, Crystal's birthday. And uh, the, the reason why I tell you that is because we went out and ate more garlic than a human should. So if you are within arm's length of me today and you're like, gosh, that guy stinks. It's because I ate so much garlic. It's not even funny. Uh, a few other birthdays. It was... Uh, it's Paul's birthday yesterday, and it's Amber's birthday today, and Greg's birthday today, and Shelly's birthday this weekend. Birthday, birthday, birthday. So everybody's birthday. But we're not here for you vile people. We're here for the Lord. So we shall, shall pray. All right. You guys excited to be here this morning? I'm excited to be here. All right, let's pray. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We glorify you today in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's alive and that it's active and that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. God, we pray today that you'd use this word to change us, challenge us, and to convict us. God, we so desperately need you to speak into our lives, God. We need you to tell us how to live and, and what to believe and just guide us this morning, Father. Use your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be in 1 Samuel 13, verses 16 through 23 this morning. Saul, Jonathan, and his son of the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Michmash, and the raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned to the road to Oprah, to the land of Shual, and another company turned to the road of Beth Haran, and another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zebron toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears, but the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattocks, and his axe, and his sickle. And the charge for a sharpening was a pin for the plowshares and the mattocks and the forks and the axes to set the points of the goad. So it came about on that, uh, excuse me, so it, uh, blah, 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 and it came about on the day of battle, that there was neither sword nor spear found on the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were but they were found with Saul and Jonathan his son, and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. So, what's going on in this story? Well, we're continuing to learn more about Saul and uh, how he's messing up and how things are not going well for him. And so, in this story, what we see is that Israel's in a huge fight with the Philistines. Saul has shown his disobedience, and now he's showing lack of leadership. Israel is retreating from the Philistines instead of fighting them. They've lost the ability to forge their own weapons. So they go to the Philistines to sharpen their tools. So when the day of battle came, that no weapons could be found in Israel's hands. This is the story that's happening here. What had been happening is they were going down to the Philistines to sharpen their tools. So when the day of battle came, no weapons could be found. They can't fight the enemy because they've lost the ability to defend themselves. They have given over to themselves to the enemy and they've said to the enemy, you know what, we're just going to depend on you uh, to be the person that is going to forge these weapons that we're going to use to defend ourselves and we're going to put our faith and hope and trust in you. Uh, the reason why America wins its wars is because we have the best weapons. Uh, we also have the best soldiers, but we've got some amazingly destructive weapons, uh, bombs that can take out a grid square and reinforced, uh, uh, you know, uh, depleted uranium rounds that come from tanks that'll shoot through 30 feet of reinforced concrete. I mean, we've got some weapons in the U.S. military arsenal. And if you take those weapons away, or if you went and to our enemies and said, hey, would you make our weapons for us? We would not be in a position as a country to be able to defend ourselves. We would never go to our enemies and say, would you make these bombs for us? And so in the day of battle, we'll just believe that they'll go off when we come back to drop them on you. We would never do that. But this is what's happening with the nation of Israel in this moment. The nation of Israel has put all of their hope, all of their trust in the enemy to help them have the weapons that they need to defend themselves. How could you ever end up going into battle without any weapons? You, you just wouldn't want to do that, right? You ever heard that saying before, don't bring a knife to a gunfight? <gasps> yeah, you know, the first rule of a gunfight is have a gun, right? That's, that's the first rule of a gunfight is have a gun. 
But this is what's happening to Israel. They've, they, they've not only have they given up their ability to, uh, uh, to the enemy, they've also lost the ability themselves to forge their own weapons and create their own defenses. It's a very bad place that Israel is in. Now today, for us, and we're going to get straight into the application this morning, is that I believe that we are not Israel, but we are connected to Israel. I believe that Father Abraham is our father. I believe that we have been engrafted into Israel. The nation of Israel still exists. I don't, I don't believe that uh, the church is Israel and Israel no longer exists. There's this dual nature that exists between God and Israel and the church. All that aside, we read the Old Testament because it applies to us as God's people. And so when we look at Israel and what happened to, you know, thousands of years ago with Saul, we look at it and we say, well, how does that apply to us? How do, we, how do we read about Israel that they became uh, unable to defend themselves and, uh, you know, ended up going into battle where only the, the king and Jonathan were able to have weapons? How does that apply to our modern day lives? Well, it applies to our modern day lives this way in that we have enemies that are coming against us. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I love those things. I'm always like, pause so they can say amen. And like two people are like, amen? <laughs> I've got enemies that are coming against me. Okay. Yeah. The church has enemies that is coming against it. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about faith and victory church. I'm talking about the global church, the church in Pakistan, the church in Croatia, the church in Ukraine, the church in other parts of America, the people that truly believe the Bible, truly believe in Jesus Christ and him crucified, the churches that are walking in the truth. There's enemies that are coming against the church that are trying to destroy us. And so the way that they come against the church is they come against the people. <clears throat> If you can destroy the people of the church, you destroy the church because the people are the church. We are the body of Christ. And so for us, it is very important that we understand who our enemy is and we understand how we're going to fight this enemy. Because if you don't know who your enemy is, you're going to fight everything. And, if you, and, and you're going to run out of steam. And if you don't know what weapons that you can use, then you're not going to be able to win against your enemy. My goal for you this morning is this is that you would learn to become a spiritual blacksmith, not give up your ability to forge your own weapons so that when the day of battle comes, you will not be found empty-handed and lose the battle against the enemy. Amen? Amen. So what are these enemies? The first enemy of the church and your life is this, false teaching. Second Peter 2, 1, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, brought, who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. If you can get a person in the church to believe false theology, you will get a church to believe false theology. Yeah. And so for us, we've got to recognize this enemy that is doing everything that he can in his power to get you to believe things that are not true about God and his word. And, and the enemy is very swift, man. He will put, he will put it in a very uh, a pretty uh, presentation. He will make it seem like it sounds good. It will feel good to your flesh. And it will slowly introduce this mindset inside of you of false doctrine, false agape love gospels, false heresy, uh, uh, gospels that are not gospels of the Bible, trying to get you to believe something that is not true about God. The reality is, is that many Christians lack basic knowledge about who they are in Christ. They lack basic knowledge about what their Bibles say. And that's why it is utterly and completely important that you devour this thing. If you would devour this thing, read this thing, memorize this thing, and know this thing, you will never be led astray. It's the reason why when people say, well, you know, I don't want to have some preacher that's going to tell me what to believe. My job isn't to tell you what to believe. My job is to tell you what the Bible says. And you fact check it by reading it yourself. It's funny, people that read their Bibles always amen me because what I preach lines up with God's word. People that don't read their Bible say, well, I don't, believe, I don't agree with what you said. Yeah, because you don't know what God's word said. If you knew what God's word said, you would amen what is being said because you know that it lines up with God's word. It's on you to know what God's word says. I'm here to help you. I'm here to guide you. But you've got to own the thing yourself. Second enemy of the church in your life is worldliness. Worldliness is an enemy that aims to destroy you. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a very clear scripture that says you've got two choices, love the world or love God. 
but you cannot love both. You can't be a person that, that, that says that they're a Christian and then spends their life loving the things of this world. And there are many people who have taken up residence in the church. And when I say the church, the global church, and we're part of the global church, that means they've taken up residence in this church as well, that do not love God more than they love the world. They don't have love of God in his church above love of the things of this world. Their priorities are of this world. Their comfort is of this world. And their life and their hope is in the things of this world. And for us that, that, that are walking in Christ, that worldly mindset that says, you know what, church is something that you do, not something that you are, will destroy you. It's an enemy. And what's interesting, the worldly, uh, the worldly Christians or worldly people will always come against the people that prioritize the, thing of, the things of God. They will mock you. They will put you down because they will say things to you like, why do you have to take it so seriously? Isn't there more to life than serving God? Isn't there more to life than his church? And in my, in my world, I say, you know what? There's nothing more important than God and his church. The rest of it is all going to burn. The rest of it has no value, which isn't to say you can't enjoy the sunshine or go out to eat for a hot dog at Costco once in a while. I'm just saying that like you can't have everything in your life wrapped up around the world and sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on it. It's not how the things work at all. See, mixing the love of the world with the love of God produces fleshly Christians who don't love God above all. It's, it's just worldliness, man. What, what worldliness manifests is that you live like the devil at work, and then you try to live like a Christian when you're in, in, in the church. It, it's interesting. As our church continues to grow, um, our spread goes from, you know, Ording to Redmond and all points in between. Like that, that's where our people are. Our, our farthest north people are uh, about Redmond. Our farthest south people are about uh, Ording or Lakewood, kind of down in that area and all points in, tw- in between. What that means is that now uh, when Crystal and I will go out to a social event somewhere in Pierce or King County, chances are we will see someone from our church. Amen. It's fun, man. FEC life. Yeah. Like we go out and see people like, hey, this is kind of fun. What's also interesting is that because I talk to absolutely everyone, um, I, 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 many times I will meet people that work with people that attend our church. Yeah. Yeah. And because I'm always trying to talk to people to say, oh, I work at XYZ. I'm like, XYZ, do you know so-and-so? And like, oh yeah, I totally know so-and-so. I'm like, oh, they go to our church. And they, go, they either go, really? Or they go, And in that moment, man, I learned everything that I need to learn, man. <laughs> People are not good liars. <laughs> Micro emotions on their face. <laughs> oh, they work with you? Uh, yeah, they go to our church. <laughs> and all I can assume is that person is living a worldly Christian existence at work. They, they, they come in here and, oh, Jesus, Jesus. Then they go out to work on Monday and they just hang up their Jesus hat on the way out the door and they go into their office and they just act like the rest of the world. Formalism is an enemy of you and this church. The Bible says in Romans 2, 28 and 29, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Paul was talking about Jewish people and how Jewish people were being circumcised on the outside, but there was no circumcision of the heart. They were acting like a Jew outwardly. They were doing the festivals, and they were doing the circumcision, doing all these other things. And he says, you know, what you're doing on the outside isn't what really matters. What matters is circumcision of the heart. It, it, It does not impress God to take part in the formalism of what Christianity is called to be with no circumcision of your heart. Coming to church, wearing a big cross on your chest, and I'm a, I'm a Christian, but there's nothing going on on the inside. If you haven't truly been converted, if you haven't truly repented, if you're not truly walking with Christ, God is not impressed. He's not impressed. The, the salvation of Christ must happen in your heart, and it must be real, and it must be tangible. It must be tangible. You must be converted, or none of it matters. You know, it, it's interesting, uh, when, when I was in the military, <clears throat> I, I, I was deployed a few times, and uh, I was deployed to Bosnia for six months, and I was deployed to um, 
Egypt for a year. And when you get deployed, uh, you, you also can go and, and forget about the, the, the intricacies of it, my military brethren, but a lot of people will uh, call the, the year away a TDY. It's not a TDY. A TDY is like a two to four m- month little thing, but people call it a TDY. I remember when I was in Egypt one time and there was a guy that had been there for a few months and I befriended him and then he actually befriended a lady friend while he was in country, which was very interesting to me because uh, when he showed up in country, he was wearing a wedding ring and then a few months later, he was not wearing a wedding ring and I said, hey man, I thought you were married. And he was like, TDY man, temporary divorce for a year. And, 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 and I thought to myself, I thought, you know what? That's a guy who's formally married that's not married in his heart. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, uh, that's a guy that says, you know what? I, I, I stood at the altar and I said these words, but my, my heart isn't really knit with my spouse. Yeah. That, that, that's the same word picture of very many people that, that, that say that they're a Christian. They'll, they'll walk to the front and they'll say the prayer out of superstition and they'll get dunked in the water out of superstition and believing that saying a prayer and getting in the water is going to save them at the, at the day of God's judgment when the reality is you cannot be saved unless you're converted. Yeah. You have got to be converted, and it's got to be a conversion of your heart. Your life has to be changed. The Bible says that you become a new creation. And if you would say to me, well, pastor, I don't understand. Like, how do I know that I've been changed? You know. <laughs> you know if you have been changed. Everybody knows if you've been changed. Diversion is your enemy. It's an enemy of this church and it's an enemy of your life. The Bible says in Mark 16, 15, and Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's just like these men did in Pakistan this month. These orders from Jesus are plain and clear. We are to preach the gospel and make disciples according to Matthew 28. But many churches and Christian organizations lose their way. Works are good, but without a message, it's not what we're called to do. The YMCA started as the Young Men's Christian Association. Now they open up gyms and communities and just do that. I mean, I know people that were literally challenged working at the YMCA because they were talking about Christ and they were told to quit talking about Christ at the YMCA. And I, I don't mean, if you go there, it's fine. It's just a gym at this point, okay? Yeah. Don't, don't feel bad and be like, well, am I doing something against God? I go to LA Fitness. They ain't Christian either. It's fine. Yeah. My point is this, is that they've lost their, they used to reach out because they wanted to reach out to young men and lead them to Christ. Going and doing good works is great, but if it's not connected to a gospel message, it's worthless. If the YMCA isn't going and preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, they're just taking care of people's physical bodies, not their spiritual needs. It's not good at all. And it's so different with other big Christian organizations that will go out there. You, you can go out and feed the sick and help the homeless, which are all great Christian things that we're supposed to be doing. Our church does these things. We go and do tangible things for people's tangible needs, but it's always connected to a gospel message. Yeah. This is a tactic of the enemy. This is the reason why there's many Christian denominations that are faltering and are dying. Yeah. It's because they have, they have disconnected works and the, and, the, and the preaching of the gospel. Yeah. And in my estimation, they deserve to die. Any church that doesn't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ no longer is valuable in the kingdom of God because the church is intended to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must never forget that. It's a diversionary tactic that the, that the evil one uh, tries to suck us into. And it happens in your life as well. Satan will bring you into all these fruitless arguments when the argument is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Are you saved? Have you been washed? Have you been set free from the law of sin and death? Coldness is your enemy and an enemy of this church. The Bible says in Revelation 2, 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Christ spoke to the church in Revelation and said, you know what? You, your heart has grown so cold that I may remove your lampstand. I might be remove myself from you because what happens with coldness is that coldness produces losing the love of the Savior and allowing sin within the assembly with no repentance. Coldness will produce a bunch of fleshly Christians that allow sin to run rampant within their lives and with their church because they don't have a a, a steaming hot fire, a burning zeal for the things of God. They become lukewarm. And so it doesn't matter if you're living a life contrary to the scriptures. It doesn't matter whether you're passionate about the things of God. You just become a a, a weak, cold uh, person living for Jesus Christ barely. 
Serving becomes a chore and not a joy. It becomes dutiful and not beautiful. Who wants a cold spouse? No one. No one wants a cold spouse, right? I mean, if, you, if you're with your spouse, what's so funny about it is, is that as, as a person, you don't even have to be a Christian. You always know when there's a problem with, with you and your spouse or you and a friend. You don't, you don't need to go to no psychomacology classes for that. You know it. You know if there's a division between you and someone else, yeah. right? You go to your spouse and like, how, is everything okay? Everything's fine. <laughs> Listen, if your spouse, if you don't know this, when your spouse says fine, they are not fine. Okay, fine means things are not fine. The same thing when your spouse says, oh, you don't need to get me anything for my birthday. That's a lie, okay? It's a test. Do not fail that test. Oh, no, 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 no. If there's a division between me and my spouse, we know it. And, 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 and if there's a division between me and a friend, we know it. I can't lie to you. I can't, pre- like, No. And then we try to pretend this game where we look at people where it's abundantly clear that their heart has grown cold against the things of God. Yes. And they say, well, how, how dare you judge me? Right. Really? Yeah. Dude, I'm just loving you, man. I'm trying to bring you back to the fire. I'm just trying to bring you back so your heart doesn't grow cold, man. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm trying to help you, man. I'm trying to bring you back to the things of God. Yes. Division is our enemy within ourselves and within our church. The Bible says in Romans 16, 17, and 18, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. Yeah. If you don't know what that means, that means stay away from people that cause division. Yeah. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but by their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. People who cause division within God's church are one of the greatest enemy because they are within the church already. And the Bible makes it very clear to stay away from these people. And you got to ask yourself, man, am I causing division or am I causing unity? And and people always live under this, under this impression of like, well, I'm just trying to help. Are you, are you really trying to help? Because usually what happens is you're defending your own position. You're trying to, and, and I don't know why. It's been like this since junior high. Some people get this rush against turning people against each other and then standing back and watching them fight. They haven't been saved. They haven't been set free. They haven't been converted. They're living a junior high school gospel that enjoys watching other people's fight so that they can feel like they have power in their own lives. They are an enemy and a tool of Satan. Be a person that desires unity, forgiveness, love, connectedness. Here, here's what was happening in this story. Is that Israel had allowed themselves to be controlled by their enemy because they gave up the skill of blacksmithing. They'd given up the skill. They said, you know what? We don't have to protect ourselves against our enemies. We're just going to get in bed with our enemies and allow them to protect us. It doesn't make any sense, man. The Bible says in verse 20, it says, But the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, his sickle. And the charge for sharpening was a pin for the plowshares. The enemy was so nice to even charge them, charge them for their work. For the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, the axes to set the points of the goads. Not only did did the Philistines take away Israel's ability to forge their weapons, but it took away their ability to be able to produce for themselves. All of those other things are uh, agricultural tools that Israel used to uh, be able to uh, do their own crops and take care of their animals. And that they had gone so deep within the enemy is that it wasn't even just their military might that they gave themselves over to. It was their production. It was the production, the means by which they were able to support the nation. They were so defeated by the enemy that they kept going down to him to get their power. Oh, wow. Wouldn't it be interesting... If there were people that had been set free from an enemy, but kept going back to the enemy to get their power. If you're a Christian and God has set you free from the law of sin and death, he delivered you from a life. He delivered you from certain friends and and certain activities. 
And then for some reason, you want to keep going back to that enemy and have that enemy speak into your life. To have that enemy have your, your ability to protect yourself. That, that enemy is going to speak into your life and say, you know what, this is how you should be living. And these are the tools that you should be l- using. And this is how you should live your life. You become completely and totally dependent on that enemy instead of completely and totally dependent on God. You're letting these enemies in your life because you have given up your blacksmithing to the enemy. Your job as a Christian is to to have the weapons necessary to fight the the enemies that are going to come against you. Amen? Amen? Now, we are not in a physical battle today. We are in a spiritual battle. We don't need plowshares and mattoxes. We're not getting pitchforks and, you know, running out in the street, man. The battles that we have are spiritual battles. They're not physical battles. You cannot fight a spiritual battle. You cannot serve a spiritual battle with a physical tool. It just doesn't work that way. The Bible says in Ephesians six twelve, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. What had happened to Israel in this story is very, very simple. They had underestimated the enemy. The, the, the Philistines were a very formidable foe, and, and they let them take their defense, blacksmithing. They, they like, and that's the part that just baffles the mind. I'm like, well, you used to know how to blacksmith, yeah. and now you just have given up, like, blacksmith at the time, you probably could have learned it again. You could have gone back and, and, and learned how to make these weapons once again, but they didn't even want to learn. They stopped learning and they said, you know what? We're just going to go to the enemy. That's a whole lot easier than trying to learn ourselves. And then they kept going back to them for their needs. I mean, the Bible calls these things the beggarly elements. They're just no good. Why do you keep going back to them? They ended up ended dependent on the enemy. And when the day of battle came, they didn't have the means to defend themselves. I will tell you that walking as a Christian, and even if you're not a Christian, this life is hard, it's rough, and it's filled with battles. Yeah. And there are things that are going to come into your life because you live in a broken world that's filled with circumstance. And if you are not preparing yourself for the day of battle and, and forging those weapons that you need to be able to fight those battles, when the battle comes, you will lose and you will lose royal because you have abdicated the necessity that you have to be able to be a spiritual blacksmith and build the tools that you need to fight against the enemy. Now, let me say this, little sidebar here, because some of you are already thinking this. Well, I thought the Bible says that we're supposed to love our enemies, and it does say that. Luke 6, 27, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. 1 Peter 3, 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But this isn't an this isn't a... <clears throat> a lesson on how to love your enemies, okay? That's a different sermon for a different time. Love your enemies. We're talking about the, the, the tool of Satan that comes against the churches trying to fight, and we've got to fight against those evil spirits that come from Satan that seek to destroy you and his church. I spent a lot of time this week reading my Bible, looking for the scripture that says we're supposed to love Satan. I haven't found it, okay? There, there, there's no scripture in there that says that we're supposed to love Satan or we're supposed to give ourselves over to him or that we should, you know, uh, take care of his needs. No, the Bible says quite the opposite. James 4, 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. First Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Ephesians four twenty seven says that we should give no place to the devil no place to him. We must forge our spiritual uh, uh, tools that we use against the enemy so that we can fight him and that we can win. But what are these weapons? These weapons are found in Ephesians chapter 6, the full armor of God. The Bible says that we must take up the full armor of God, not part of it. It says that we should take up the full armor of God, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done it all to stand. And so the Bible goes through uh, in, in Ephesians all these different parts of our spiritual armor that we should have to be able to fight against the evil one. It says in verse 14, Ephesians 6, 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth 
girded your waist with truth. It's funny, if you gird your waist with the waist of, waist of truth, you fight the enemy of false doctrine because you know the truth. It's funny, if, and that's where it all starts. If you do not have a spiritual belt, you will lose your spiritual pants. And you do not want to go into battle without any pants. That's not what you want to do. So you've got to know the truth. You've got to walk in the truth. Satan is the father of lies. If you are not a truthful person and you lie a lot, you are showing kinship with Satan. Every time you lie, you say to an unbelieving world that Satan is my father. And so you do not want to tell the world that Satan is your father. You want to be a person of truth and God is your father. The Bible says that we should put on the breastplate of righteousness. When we've got that breastplate of righteousness, we're able to fight against worldliness. Amen? We have that breastplate and says that Christ is my righteousness. He is my defender. He is my shield. My righteousness is found in him, not me. Uh, Don't wear a breastplate that's forged by the enemy of worldliness. Your breastplate is the first thing that somebody sees, and they better see Christ or they're going to see the world. When you forge that breastplate of righteousness, you tell an unbelieving world that you are not of this world, that Christ is your Savior and that He is the one that is protecting you. Do not go to the enemy's camp for your provision and your protection. There's nothing good there at all. The Bible says in verse 15 that we should shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is the true gospel of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And when we know the true gospel of the forgiveness of sins and repentance and that Christ truly converts, we fight against the evil of formalism. We're able to keep formalism from coming into our lives because we know the true gospel of peace. When you've got sturdy shoes, you can walk forward into battle. You're not going to walk through and be able to lose. You're going to win because you're able to move forward with the true gospel of peace that's going to fight that enemy of formalism. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You you have got to forge that shield of faith. Faith defends against the accusations of Satan. Faith in Jesus above all. Satan wants to destroy you. Faith in Jesus will defend you. This is that part of fighting that enemy of diversion. If you've got that shield of faith and God has given you marching orders, you march forward in the the words of Jesus Christ saying, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to make disciples of all nations. Satan comes against you trying to give you diversionary tactics. You've got that shield. You're able to fight it off and say, do you know what, Satan? You are not going to bring me anywhere except forward in battle because I know what I've been called to do. Amen? Verse 17, and I must take the helmet of salvation. You've got to forge that helmet, man. And that helmet of salvation is a mind that must always be reminded that you are in a saved state before God. You are a king's kid. You are protected and you are loved by the creator. And if you are saved, what do you have to be worried about? And when you've got that helmet of salvation, you can fight the coldness of the, uh, the enemy of coldness because you're, you're all constantly thinking about the things of God. You know that you're saved. You know that you've been set free. You come into a worship service, you don't feel like worshiping. You remind yourself, I've been saved. I've been set free. I need to worship the God of this universe. Amen. Somebody comes against you and something goes wrong in your life and you say, you know what? I'm saved. I'm set free from the law of sin and death. I don't have to be worried with anything that's going on in my life. Amen. The Bible says that we need to have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Folks, we have got to have the word of God. And we've got that word of God. We're able to know what the word says. We're able to fight against false doctrine. We're able to fight against things that would come against you and your church because you know what the word of God says. It's a fighting thing. You have to ingest your word. You have to know it. You have to live it. You have to be able to learn it. Verse 18 says that we're praying always with all prayer and all supplication in the spirit. You know, what's interesting about diversion is that diversion always comes within the church and people want to always go and attack the diversion. And, 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 my, and my thought is this, is that the way to, fa- to attack diversion is diversion is a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. So I'm just going to pray in all spirit and all supplication. It's very easy. If you're a divisive person, I'm praying for God to remove you from our church. Yeah. Yeah. 
We pray that in our meeting every single week. Lord, remove the divisive people from within our church. And people would say, well, that's kind of rude, isn't it? What's ruder, to be inside of God's church and try to destroy it from the inside out? You have no place here. You have no place to be inside of God's church. So I'm going to pray in the Spirit with all supplications in ways that, that the world is not going to understand, and God will spiritually remove those things within our church that are trying to divide us. You have to be prayed up. You have to have the Spirit man built up, being watchful to this end with all perseverance, and supplication for the saints, man. You're not in this alone. The saints of God walk with you. The saints of Pakistan and Ukraine and Croatia, the East Coast, the West Coast, the South. You've got to pray and believe that all these saints that are in the truth are keeping watch. We're paying attention to what's going on around us and we will not be led astray, amen? The blacksmith cannot operate on his own. He has got to be around other people that are blacksmithing to forge these spiritual tools to be able to fight against the enemy enemies of God and his church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? If you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. And it's really quite simple. Either you've given your life to Jesus or you haven't. You've been forgiven of your sins or you haven't. And I believe in a big, huge, powerful God that is able to do above and beyond anything that you could ever ask or imagine. Either you've been forgiven or you haven't. Either you're living for him or you are not. And if you would say this morning, and as this message was going forth, I believe that the conviction of the Holy Spirit was coming upon you and you felt a a, a prickling in your spirit that said, man, I'm not where I need to be. I've got to live for Jesus. I've got to live this God life. I've, I've never made a decision to live for God. And you need to make that decision for the first time today. We want to pray with you and pray for you. This isn't superstition. You don't say, I want to live for Jesus and then go back and live a different life. You make a decision to walk your life in a different direction. And if you've never made that decision before and you want to do it for the first time, I want you to raise your hand right now and say, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. And we will pray with you. Is there anybody that needs to do that for the first time? Hey man, I see your hand, brother. Is there anybody else that needs to make that decision? A brother, would you walk up here? Billy, would you walk up here with him? Would you pray with him, please? Listen, man. This is, a, this is the best day of your life. This is the best day of your life. It's good. Now just stand right here. Billy, stand here. Pray with him, would you? You guys can stand over there to the side. Just go take this one. Go over there with Billy. Billy will pray with you. I didn't say to look. Keep your eyes down. <laughs> Jesus changes lives, folks. He still converts. He still saves. He still sets free. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a weapon in your life that you've let grow dull. Would you just ask the Lord, Lord, sharpen this, sharpen this tool in my life. Help me to live for you, God. And, and, and it's not our power, it's his power. It's Christ's power in us. He gives us these tools, but he's the tool maker. He's the tool power. He's the one that makes it work. Father, we submit to you today, God. We submit to you today, God. We, help, we, we ask that you would help us to be spiritual blacksmiths so we can be able to do your work on this earth, God. We submit to your lordship this morning. We submit to your powers. We submit to your love. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen, amen.